Hey Young Mac Middle School, so great to see all of you guys again. Um, I just wanted to start again with some announcements before we begin. Um, so we had Bible study this past Wednesday, um, and I was really happy to see a lot of new faces coming out. So um, hello to everybody who came out this past Wednesday. I hope to see even more faces coming out this Wednesday when we have Bible study again. Um, we're going to be going over Genesis 1 and 2, and we're going to talk about the creation story a little bit. And I feel like it's going to be a lot of stuff that you haven't heard before, so I hope you guys can make it out. Um, secondly, this week I'm going to be sending out an email with actually a special sign-up link, because we are planning to have a drive through meet and greet uh, for all of our new students and our uh, uh, old students. Uh, 8th grade students now, right? Now you guys aren't 7th graders anymore. Our 8th grade students and our new 7th and 6th grade brothers and sisters. We are having a drive through meet and greet for all of you guys, okay? So make sure you have uh, the email. Make sure you're signed up for my email list. If not, you can always text me or uh, just notify me somehow and I will add you to the list as soon as I can. Um, and once you can do that, all of the teachers that are going to be serving next year, they're going to be at this meet and greet. So I hope you can make it, okay? Really, really try. I, I'm going to be calling each of you and hopefully all of you guys can make it. Uh, all right. <clears throat> so that is all for our announcements for today. So let's pray first before we begin. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that we continue to fall deeply in love with you. We want to continue to learn more about who you are through the word as we read about your people and our amazing God. Open up your word to us today and give us your Holy Spirit so that we can understand and appreciate the amazing ways in which you have guided the Israelite people. Thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Before we begin, I love to do this every week, but let's recap what we talked about last week. Because, like I said, every time we read a book of the Bible, it's all one book. Right, So if we don't remember what happened uh, last week, we're not going to know what happened this week. Right, It's kind of like you're trying to watch a TV show. You can't just jump into the middle of the season. you got to know what happened last time. So let's just do a quick recap. We learned about how the book of Joshua is about being on either God's side or the world's side. Right, There's no middle ground. It's not about Israelites versus everyone else. It's about whether you want to be on God's side or the world side. And the Israelites also have to make that choice, right? So we talked about how Joshua and the Israelites, as they travel through the promised land, they also have to make that choice. They have to make the choice of whether they're going to be on God's side and win or stand against God and be destroyed, right? That was a point of the commander of the Lord's armies. Remember, what did Joshua do when he met this commander? And his commander said, I am on God's side says that Joshua bowed down and he worshipped, right? That's the only proper response when we come into contact with God. Now, what does it mean to be on God's side, though? And what are the consequences of being either on God's side or against God? Well, there are two stories from Joshua that we can actually use to answer those questions. And today, today we're going to see what happens when we are on God's side. What happens? What, are, what happens when we are on God's side? And, and what, are we, what, are this, what does it look like when people uh, want to be on God's side? Okay, so let's read with these, let's begin with the story of Jericho. Okay, now that is from Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Again, that's from Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Now, I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with this story, but let's just read it really quickly because I want to point out a few things, all right? So, Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Now, Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with this king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. See, God commands Israel to go and march around the city of Jericho for seven day, days, and then on the seventh day, to blow their trumpets and shout. And somehow, that was supposed to give Israel the victory, 
over the fortified city of Jericho. Now, I'm sure all of us have heard this story at least once or twice in Sunday school or, or even Veggie Tales or in a sermon. Um, and it's a great story. It shows how God's power is able to give the victory to the Israelites, right? I mean, we have to think about this, though. We have to stop and think about this. This isn't um, taking place in some random fantasy land where magical stuff happens all the time, right? This is still in the real world. This is history, meaning... Why does this work? Why, why does this work? Why does marching around the city and blowing a trumpet, how does that beat Jericho? It's so weird, right? How is that supposed to defeat a city, a whole city back then? And I feel like sometimes we just read this story and we go, oh, yeah, see, we just march and we blow our trumpets and then they, they beat everyone because God is good. Amen. And then that's it. We don't really think about what happened. And I think when we stop to really think about what God asked the Israelites to do, you know, march around the city and then blow the trumpets and then just shout and then you'll beat the whole city. Isn't that kind of dumb? <laughs> Isn't it kind of dumb? Like, why would God command the Israelites to just walk around the walls and, and sing? What kind of battle strategy is that? I mean, think about how dumb this must have looked to the people living in Jericho, right? Like, if you read in the rest of Joshua chapter 6, Joshua actually tells the Israelites they are not to say or, or even have any sound come out of their mouth while they're walking around the city, except on the last day. Meaning, these people, all these people, were marching around a city in complete silence for seven days. For seven days. Imagine how crazy this must have looked. It's really weird. <laughs> and yet, when Israel, when they trusted in God's instruction and had faith that God would fight for them, they won. This worked somehow. <laughs> and I want to point out that this is the type of faith that God wants. And that's the point that I want to make today. Okay, That's the point that I want to make today. The point is, being on God's side means having a desperate faith. Being on God's side means having a desperate faith. Now, I'm not talking about faith like, oh, I, I believe that. Okay, I'm talking about faith that is desperate, right? A faith that is so, uh, so desperate for God that you have nothing else, right? A faith that, that says, God, if I don't have you, I have nothing, right? A faith that has no other choice but God. That's the type of desperate faith that I think Israel has in this passage. Because Israel didn't march because they're just so amazing and like they just believe God and stuff. Israel was marching and doing this because Israel had no other choice. That's all they had. You got to understand too, right? Like people think that Israel was like super strong or had this amazing army. That's not true, right? In fact, in Joshua chapter 5, it says that Israel, Joshua commands that all the Israelites get circumcised. Now, I don't know about, uh, I don't know about explaining this right now, but for those of you who don't know what it is, it's a very painful surgery where they cut off part of the skin on the private parts of men, right? That, that sounds very painful. It sounds excruciatingly painful. Right? And they, that had just happened in Joshua chapter 5. And then now these guys were going to fight? Ooh, I don't know. Also, it's not like Israel had any battle training. They were slaves in Egypt before they came here, right? They never learned how to fight. None of these guys were martial arts masters or something. Like, they, they don't know how to fight. They're mostly farmers and shepherds, right? Some of them have probably never even held a weapon before. And not just that. Like, did you guys know in Deuteronomy, with some of the laws that God gives for warfare, he actually says, hey, if anyone in the army has just gotten married or just built a house or just started a business or even if you're just too scared to fight you don't have to fight you don't have to fight an army just go home be with your wife or go home start your business god literally says if you're too too afraid even it's okay you don't you don't have to fight an army meaning this is not like a huge group of massive elite fighters who are just super buff and spend all their time training. Like, they're shepherds. These are farmers. These are people that don't have that much experience. And 
Jericho is this powerful city with huge walls. Israel had no idea how they're going to defeat them. In fact, if they if they went in there with no plan, they probably would have all just been killed. And so when God tells Joshua, "This is what you are to do," the Israel's are, the Israelites are like, "Well, that's better than no plan." <laughs> and so they did it. It came out of desperation. They're like, well, we got no other options. We have no idea how to beat Jericho with their giant walls and their strong uh, fighting army. Let's, let's just do what God said because we don't have any other choice. You see, their faith came from desperation. They had no other options. What were they supposed to do? What was the alternative? Right? So do you see when the Israelites were the strongest? It was when... It wasn't when they had the most money or the best fighter or the most power. The Israelites were the strongest when they were the weakest. When they couldn't fight for themselves so that God had to fight for them, that was when they were strongest. That was when Israel won. That's when Israel desperately prays to God to save them. That's when Israel had desperate faith. That's when Israel was on God's side. And that's what it says in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 through 10. It says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong." It is when Israel was weakest that they were the strongest. And that's not all. Okay? Because in the same way, Rahab, okay, she was a prostitute who was living in the city of Jericho. Do you know what a prostitute? A prostitute is a woman who's or a man who sleeps with other people for money. Right? So it was it was a very degrading profession, right? And she was also a part of the enemy. She was part of Jericho. She was living in Jericho, right? And yet God saves her. Why? Well, it's the same reason that God gave victory to Israel over Jericho, right? She trusted in God with a desperate faith that he would deliver her and her family. So let's read together from Joshua chapter 2, verses 9 through 13. Look at what Rahab says to the spies that she hides. And she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you will also deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. Think about how much faith Rahab needed to have to do this. She had to have faith that God would defeat Jericho. Otherwise, she would have been killed for being a traitor to her country. Did you know that Rahab lies in the face of the king of Jericho? Would you be able to betray your family? Would you you be able to betray your friends and your country if you thought they were going to lose? Think about the incredible amount of faith that Rahab needed to have because she had to believe first that God was going to win, right? Not only that, think about this promise that she made with the spies. Was there any guarantee that the spies were going to keep this promise? No. If she just died in Jericho, nobody would have remembered her. Nobody would have remembered that the spies uh, needed or made this promise with Rahab. No. But she had to trust the spies. She had to trust that when they swore to God, that God would make sure that she would be saved. Right? That's crazy. Would you do this? Would you gamble and take a bet that might make you lose everything, even your life? Yet Rahab had this type of desperate faith because Rahab was weak. 
She had no power. She had no wealth. She had no money. She had no sort of condition for this. She just was, she just had that desperate faith in God. And she wanted to save her family and she believed that God would save her. She believed that God would win and that God would be victorious. And when she was able to admit that, she was rescued. When she's able to admit her own weakness and come to God for help, God rescued her. When she was weak, she was made strong. What made Israel strong? What made Rahab strong? Israel was not this amazing, mighty nation, right? In the same way, Rahab was not this amazing, mighty person. Israel had a mighty God that everyone was afraid of. I mean, look what it says in the passage that we just read, right? What does Rahab say to the spies? For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites. right? And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. You see, it's not Israel versus Jericho. It's God versus the rest of the world. Which side will you choose? And that's what it means to be on God's side. It means being weak. It means admitting that you need His help, that you can't do anything, that we can't do anything. So are you desperate? Are you desperate for God? Is God the only thing that you have? I'm going to bet that most likely not. Probably not. Most of the time when we hear that we should have faith in God, it's not this type of desperate faith. It's not that big of a deal. We have other options. I've Christianity doesn't work out. I'll just be Muslim or Buddhist or or atheist, whatever. I've, you know, if things aren't going well at school, it's okay. I'll just pray a little bit here and there. I'll figure something out. You know, I I know God wants me to talk to that person or that 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 girl or that boy at school that nobody else wants to talk to. I know God wants me to stand up against bullying. I know God doesn't want me to treat my siblings this way. But it's, eh, it's okay. Maybe some other time. See, that's part of the problem. We have too many options. Our faith is weak because we never need God. We just kind of want Him, right? Because we have video games. We have fast food. We have YouTube. We have clothes, toys, TV, money. Why would we ever need God? And in so many ways, we are not living on God's side. We continue to live on the world's side because it's so much easier to choose the world. You know, I don't like church. I can always go to another one. I don't like my friends. I'll just make a new one. I don't like this God. Let me just make a new one. When we cannot understand how much we need God, we will never be able to fully be on God's side. And next week, we'll see what happens when we fail at this, when we fail at being on God's side. Okay, What happens when God isn't enough? What happens when we don't see our weakness in front of God? Tune in next week. Let's pray. Jesus, we pray that we understand that we cannot live without you. I pray that all of our church, that all of Young Neck Church, will be filled with people who are desperately seeking to love you and know who you are. Show us, God, how weak we truly are so that we can rely on you more and more. I pray that we can learn from the humility of Rahab and the desperation of the Israelites in this passage to follow you with all of our heart, soul, and strength. We love you so much. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Remember, don't turn it off. We're going to have praise right after this. So hopefully you guys will enjoy that. And uh, I'll see you guys next week or hopefully Wednesday. Hi, Young Nak. Uh, Welcome back to Sunday morning uh, service. We're so glad that you guys decided to join us from your homes today. Um, Let's just get right into it. Uh, So before we start worship, Uh, Like always, let's just spend uh, a minute or two just to get our hearts ready before God. And the reason we do this is because, you know, when we're singing these songs, when um, we're listening to this sermon, um, the purpose is to engage with God. The purpose is to 
come uh, as a community, even if we may be physically uh, distanced at the moment, and to come before the God who we have all committed our lives to and who has laid down his own life for us, and to pray to him, to sing worship to him, and to listen to his word. And so in order to do that rightly, uh, yeah, we got to spend that time because our hearts don't come ready. You know, uh, There's so many things that we come with uh, from our week. So let's just spend a minute just reflecting. Let's spend a minute reflecting on two things. Number one, just how your week has gone. You know, Maybe it's gone really fast, slow, it's good or bad. Um, regardless, just reflect on your week. And two, reflect on the gospel. Reflect on Christ's love for you. Reflect on the, co- on the cross and the price that was paid there. And let's give thanks for that. Let's just spend time going earnestly uh, and genuinely before God. Jesus, you are present with every single family and every single individual watching this morning. And God, I pray not just for your omnipresence, but God, I pray for your personal presence. Lord, because we know you're everywhere, God. Lord, we believe that, but oftentimes, Lord, we forget Lord, how close you really are. God, how powerful you really are how you desire to be intimate with us. And so I pray that your spirit would really be present amongst every single person watching. God, as you came down um, in fire, Lord, on the disciples, God, as you came down so many other times, Lord, in your word, God, I pray that you would be present, that we would be aware of you and that that would bring us to our knees in worship. God, we want you. God, teach us to engage with you and worship. Show us what that looks like. God, whether that just means being on our knees praying, God, or singing, or clapping, or dancing, or simply listening. God, if we have to turn off our phones, convict us of that, Lord. Whatever it takes, whatever distraction that is there for us right now that wants to keep us away from you, God, take that away. Lord, give us the strength, Lord to give our full focus, our full attention to you because you deserve it. So God, remind us of the gospel this morning. Remind us of the cross. Remind us of your love for us. And when we bring our brokenness and lay it down there, God, we worship you because you deserve it. Remind us and stir our hearts again to worship. In your name we pray. Amen.
strength is failing The end draws near And my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise Unending Ten thousand years and then Up 
Then he turned me around and he placed my feet on solid ground. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Cause he picked me up and he turned me around and he placed my feet on solid ground. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now I've got love, joy, peace, and righteousness.
satisfy in my Jesus you sat say this to him in my Jesus you satisfy in my Jesus you satisfy our King of Heaven after Oh